How's it going? Good evening, students. My name's Alvin, as I told you beforehand. Um, I've been coming to New Life about eight years. I've been about, roughly about five years with the youth group. I have two kids, seven and turning seven next Tuesday, and two and a half turning three in November. Um, I play here at the worship band. I play sometimes on Sundays as Gabe needs me to fill in on there, so you may have seen me on the Sunday service screwing up on guitar. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm also part of the presentation team here. I joined the presentation team initially because I wanted to run games, because that's the fun part of it. And then they're like, hey, you can speak. I was like, cool. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Greg, Greg did a really great job kicking, off, kicking us off the series last week about changing in seasons. And tonight we're talking about friendship. And as he was talking, I realized like, how friendship really tied hand in hand with my past. Um, for some of you, you may not know this, but I was not born in Pennsylvania. I was born in Michigan. And from the time I hit preschool, I had lived in five different states. And I, up to this point in my life, I think I've moved, maybe not cities, but if you count individual apartments and houses, probably close to 30 times. Um, so I was born in Michigan. My parents moved to Indiana, the state, Kentucky, South Carolina, and Virginia. In Virginia, I was homeschooled for preschool, which, I mean, it's really just juice box and nap time, but still homeschooled. Um, and then second grade, I went to a private Christian school. So, like, I've had these changes in my life for second and third grade, and it's always a little bit difficult. Then my parents are like, private school is too expensive. We pay taxes. Go to public school. It's like, okay, I'm eight. I don't really have a say in anything anyway, so I go to public school for third and fourth grade in Virginia. I was like, this is really fun. I'm starting to enjoy this. And my dad's like, hey, guess what? We're moving again. Awesome. So we moved to Scrantonbury, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre area of Pennsylvania on the other side of the state. Um, and yes, it does smell over there because Philadelphia is over there. And I will say that on TV and I will not regret it one bit. <laughs> I lived over there, I know. So I was over there for fifth grade. I was like, okay, finally we can settle down. I was there nine months and we moved to Indiana, Pennsylvania. So in sixth grade, I had been in like five different schools up to sixth grade. It was, it was crazy. So I'm in elementary school in sixth grade, and like my parents are like, this is where we're staying. I was like, cool. And we did stay there. But from sixth grade in elementary school, I then transitioned into junior high, so completely different class. We went from like 300 to 900 students in my class. So that was another transition in my life. Then, you know, junior high is up to ninth grade. Then I went into high school. And fortunately, I was able to graduate. I didn't have to change schools. I changed buildings, but I didn't have to change schools. Um, but while I was in Indiana, I did move, I think, in four different houses. The longest I was ever in a house through high school was almost five years. So I moved a lot as a child, and there's a lot of transition. And since that point, after I graduated, I'm like, you know what? I'm done with Pennsylvania because the state is terrible. I'm going to move out. So I went to school in New York. Then I went to Kentucky, which if I had my say, I, I would still be there. But God says, no, you're here. Um, then I went to Georgia. So since I've graduated high school, I've lived in, this is now my fourth state that I've lived in since graduating high school, um, which is maybe almost before some of you guys were born. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. I feel really old up here. <laughs> Um, so then I moved back to the area, and I've been here ever since. But since I've been here, like I said, I've moved in the Butler County area, I think, four or five times. The house I'm currently in is the longest I've ever stayed in one place, and that's pushing seven years. And I, think, I think I just crested seven years in one house. So, like, I'm getting the urge to change seasons of my lives again, and we need to sell our house. And my wife's like, no, you're stupid. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> So in all that movie, I learned a lot of things, um, some life lessons, some useful, some not, like how to pack a truck or a CRV or a Civic effectively. Like, I'm, I can tell you, I can get almost my whole house in my car. I learned that skill set, but I also learned a skill set in friendships and how to make friends. <laughs> Corey, you're laughing, it's cracking me up, you gotta stop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so whenever you change schools and you change that much, you learn you don't really want to be the new kid. Nobody's, like, nobody's itching like, hey, let me move across state next week and start my life over. But you learn how to blend in and you learn how to be the new kid 
and still make it in that area, whether it's your new neighborhood, your new school, your new church, whatever it is. Which brings me to our take-home point, and that's the point I'm going to try to make. We'll see how well it goes tonight um, throughout the message, and that is when God's in your social circle, you'll never be alone. Now, this idea comes from the book of Daniel, and I'm sure most of you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You may have not read it, but I guarantee you've watched the VeggieTales version. And if you haven't, like, you've got to watch that. It's so good. And that's still what I go to think of, like a giant chocolate bunny, but that's not what the story's about. So we're going to recap it real quickly because I'm rambling already and we're like five minutes into this. Um, the story, basically, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are living in this area in the Middle East. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. I just drew a blank. But anyways, Middle East is already hot as it is and it's miserable. I don't know why anyone chooses to live there. It's desert everywhere. It's disgusting. Um, but... King Nebuchadnezzar builds this giant golden statue, and he says, at this certain time when you hear these horns and these harps and all these things going, everyone needs to bow down and worship. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are like, no, because God gave our boy Moses some commandments a while back, and he says, the first one is don't have any gods before me, so we're not going to do that. And King Nebuchadnezzar is like, well, then I'm going to throw you in this furnace in the middle of the desert. And they're like, okay, well, God's got our back. We're going to have our faith in him. So he binds them up, and he throws them into the furnace. And he says, let's heat this thing up seven times what it normally is, which is crazy because when they open it up, the people who went to throw them in were burnt alive. Like, that's the kind of reason this guy had. And he's like, great, I won, except he didn't. Because we see in Daniel 3, 24 through 25, it says, The king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste and declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and there appear to be a fourth like a son of God. So we see this when they're thrown in. He's like, Wait, no, I'm not saying things. There's four people in there. And when you read further on, you realize that God came down and protected them from the fire in that instance. It's just a really cool image of how when we have our faith in God, how nothing can hurt us. But what we don't often look at in this passage is when you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, Benny's not like, they said to not do it, throw them in, not me. They had each other's back. They said, no, this is what's right. I'm going to stand with my friends and I'm going to do what God commanded me to do. Um, I saw this quote on social media. And I thought it was really powerful. And then I realized it stems from Proverbs too. But the quote was this. If you surround yourself with six millionaires, you'll become a millionaire. Surround yourself with six bodybuilders, you'll get in shape. Surround yourself with six entrepreneurs, and you'll become an entrepreneur. Surround yourself with six fools, and you'll be a fool. Proverbs 13.20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and you'll get in trouble. You see, the company you keep, the people you hang out with, will always define who you are as a person. I know this because when I would change schools, I knew that if I did X, Y, and Z, I would be accepted by this social group, whether it was the skaters or the cool kids or the jocks or whatever. But I knew how to infiltrate, infiltrate social circles to be the kind of person that I wanted to be. And more often than not, it wasn't the person that God wanted me to be, which is vastly more important. Um, I have a verse I want to talk about, and it's going to be kind of like a sharp transition. Don't know how to do this. Pastor Alex probably would because he's good at this. But 1 Peter 5 8 says, Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary is the devil. The av- your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whomever he may devour. That verse is powerful because it's not like, you know, the devil's a prankster or a trickster. He's going to tie your shoelaces and watch you trip and laugh at you. No, he says he's like a devil. He's like a lion seeking whoever he may devour. And this was just kind of, was really powerful to me. And like, it's not, it's not a game to him. He's out to kill and destroy Ecclesiastes 4, 10 through 11 says, For if, if they fall, 
one will lift up his fellow. But woe is him who is alone when he falls and has not another one to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. The devil is going to always try to separate you, to isolate you, to make you feel like you're not important. And that's an easy thing to do. And we're going to kind of demonstrate that right now. Um, for those who don't know, this handsome gentleman is Dan. He's a small group leader. And I picked him because, because if you look at this, if you look at this, like there is, there's muscle there. Don't be modest. All right, Dan, I want you to demonstrate something for me. Can you rip that piece of cardboard? Strong. All right, Dan. This is you and your friends. You got three pieces of cardboard here. Can you break that apart? Good. However, you, see that? He has three of them. He can still get through it. This is your social circle, Jan, Dan. And this is Jesus, whenever you incorporate him into your friends. Whenever your life is surrounded by what he says and you strive to do what he wants you to do. Probably should have done this beforehand. This is really noisy. Can you rip that apart? You see the veins? See the veins? Look at that. If I took the tape off, I could rip it off. Yeah, you could. But see, that's the point of this demonstration. You can try. This is your social circle. This is your friends. When you incorporate your faith and whenever you incorporate Jesus into that. Thanks a lot. You see, the devil is a lion seeking whomever he may devour. He can devour you one at a time. He can devour you one at a time in a group. But if you surround your life and your friends with Jesus and everything you say, think, and do, he cannot penetrate that. He cannot get through that. And he will not prevail in that situation. So that's going to be our next step. That's what we're going to try to do this week. So, and that's, I'll bring Jesus into my friendships this week. And Ironically, I had a student come to me last time I sp spoke about this topic, and I didn't know what to say at the time, but like this is, this is it right here, you know. If you want your friends to take you seriously, you're going to introduce them to Jesus. If they are your true friends, they're going to be the ones who stick with you in the fire whenever it gets hot. They're going to be the ones when Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, get in there. They're not going to be the ones that throw you under the bus and run away anytime there's an issue. And if you truly, truly care about your friends that don't know Jesus, you'll know that their eternity in heaven is vastly more important than a friendship on earth right now. It's easy to look the other way and be like, no, I want these friends. But if you really care about them, you'll bring Jesus to them and you will be Jesus to them in that instance. Like Dan, he can tear you apart. He can tear you apart, tear your group apart one by one. If you bring Jesus into your social circle, he's not going to be able to break you down. He's not going to be able to make you feel worthless. The devil can't do anything against that. So if you're willing to do that, say this with me, and that's our next step, and that's, I will bring Jesus into my friendships this week. Good job. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to be dismissed a small group. Father God, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with everybody tonight about this topic. I just thank you for the life experience that you've given me in, in moving and seeing how in those moments when I was being the new person, um, trying to make friends, uh, and un understanding that struggle now that it was to bring these kids this message tonight, Father. I just thank you for small group time. I thank you for the time we had in games. I just pray that you'd be here in this room with every small group and that you would guide their, guide their conversations tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.